Hello and welcome to the Scrunary. Uh, I am Nick Barron from Breaker Press Games. Um, you are? I'm Trevor Stamper from uh, Blind, <laughs> Blind Visionary Publications. What a smooth handoff. <laughs> what can you say? You try. <laughs> that was the best. Uh, I'm Skeeter Green from SGP. Hello, everybody. All right. That's all three of us. And <laughs> Elena is here as our producer. Um, so uh, I am looking at the uh, looking at the thing. All right. Trevor, it's you. It's me. No, no. So <laughs> we're here today to talk to Skeeter Green. And Skeeter Green is uh, is well known in the DCC and MCC community for putting out quite a few Kickstarters in the past year or two. Um, we're going to talk, uh, we're going to kind of go over those Kickstarters and let Skeeter tell us some of the highlights of them and everything and the things, you know, he's focused on and maybe where he's going, if he has, if he can talk about that yet. Oh, but yeah. Then we're going to dive back in and we're actually going to spend uh, the majority of this episode um, looking at Skeeter's Kickstarters in, uh, in a little bit of detail. So we're going to, we're going to kind of talk through ways uh, that Skeeter uh, uses Kickstarter, uh, things he looks for to know that he's doing well um and and things like that uh, marketing uh that he does or doesn't use or would like to use in the future and stuff and so that's the focus yeah. of tonight's episode so skeeter uh you're well known uh in the dcc community for for crypt of the science wizard um which is an adventure now my understanding is there's three parts right we've only seen part one so far well it is indeterminate how many parts there are ah uh that's kind of an ongoing thing that even i don't really know it's okay i know the the uh skeleton outline of the story i'm just not sure how long it's going to take to tell that whole story great so so part one is out and we're going to see one. more Correct. parts coming Correct. and uh, and we don't know how many parts there are yet but you don't either so that's kind of the magic of it yeah uh crypt of the science wizard 2 is going to go to kickstarter in the second quarter of next year awesome awesome okay so we'll see that sometime in april uh june. yeah april may june ish timeline wonderful okay and then beyond uh crypt of the science wizard you also have the crypto codex which is a uh, specifically mutant crawl classics although it can be used obviously with dcc um yeah. kind of uh animal compendium right it has a whole bunch of different mutants mutated yeah creatures. um it had what I like to call it is it's it's not a monster book. It's a not even adversary book. It's just things, people, beings, mutants that you will encounter. And it actually came to pass. Um, I had to come up with a, a bunch of monsters and adversaries for Crypt of the Science Wizard. And I had some more ideas rattling around in my brain. And I thought, who doesn't like a monster book? And the goal with the monster book was actually to make things that were viable and usable. Because right. I, I don't know what your guys' experience with some monster books, but sometimes it seems like there are things in there that are just filler for page count <laughs> and they are oh hey that's an interesting idea i would never use this in a campaign um i try i definitely have some of those in crypto codex uh that you know i have titans and you're not gonna have those in every dungeon they are very specific but they allude to things you can do with the rule sets which uh was an interesting experiment it, it really was, especially for the MCC and and trying to balance mutations for these ultra powerful uh, creatures and what just becomes ridiculous. You know, at, at, at what point is this, this shouldn't even be in a monster book because you can't do anything to it. So that was something I had to claw back on a little bit uh, for even my own ideas. Right. Okay. So that that's cool. Um, and, uh, and then you also have a six part series Valley out of time, uh, that just, uh, just finished up, right? I believe that Kickstarter, the last Kickstarter ended up ended within the last month. Is that right? 
yeah it was two weeks ago because i actually just got funds the other day awesome <laughs> so awesome. so i know that two week period is closed uh yeah that was my uh desire to create a campaign that was self-contained but you could also just slot it into um, your home campaign there wasn't a lot of uh, specificity tried to get that word out right uh, so it would be easier to integrate into an existing campaign or another series of adventures and the goal for that was for me to create uh, a Frank Frazetta painting that is a game campaign which worked marvelously for DCC and MCC. Um, you know, this is the Neanderthals with the pointy stick and a giant mastodon coming at you, except the mastodon has eight trunks. And, you know, it, it, it has these little sci-fi swerves, um, but it's still very fantasy-based at the core. Got it. So, you know, your your land of the lost, your uh, journey to the center of the earth, that kind of stuff. Okay. So, you know, Pellucidar and all of that. Yep. And Edgar Wright Absolutely. Wrote. Yeah. There, there was some art included in the book that was just basically an homage slash knockoff of Pellucidar work. Yeah. Because it's just, cool. that's, that's my jam. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, that's yeah, really yeah, what I like. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a fun uh, kind of concept to play with. Right. And, and yeah. And, you know, the, the stop motion photography, the Sinbad, you know, fighting the skeletons and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. That was absolutely what I was going for. Cool. And then you have uh, now, now most of those, uh, well, all of those uh, are DCC MCC. You did run Crypt of the Science Wizard twice as a Kickstarter which is a really interesting concept. Not everybody does that. Once for fifth edition slash swords and wizardry, and then you reran it. Is that my understanding? For yeah, I, uh, I I cleaned it up and changed it, uh, added another encounter to the beginning of that and um, redid it for DCC. And the DCC MCC community is like nothing else. And I know we're on their their uh, channel right now so i'm not just you know blowing <laughs> smoke um the the community has been extremely accepting uh, they're very interested in what i'm trying to get out onto shelves and i'm very appreciative of of being acknowledged as well as i have and sgp has so and yeah. and that has led to some um product design changes that are specifically to cater to DCC and MCC. So uh, more of that will happen with Crypt of the Science Wizard 2. That is going to be an MCC release. Okay. Very so specifically. Let's come right back to that. But I do want to mention there's one other Kickstarter oh, yeah. that done, Skeeter, and that is uh, Derelict's Diary, which... If I remember correctly, that's a Mork board product, and it was like, um, it it was like a, it's not a slave ship. It was like a a penal ship or something like that. Was that no? That's that's a different. That? No, that's that's a different different project. Uh, okay, that, that's Seven Aboard the Shackle from uh -huh. World of Game Design. You're right. I'm getting confused. Yeah, and I actually played that at GaryCon, and it was fantastic. I was oh, cool. so impressed with it. Yeah. So um, what was no, Derelict's what Diary I, about? Derelict's Diary was me creating 30 specific pregens for Morkboard games. Oh, okay. Uh, the, the idea being that I don't have a home campaign. So the only time I play tabletop in person is at conventions. And a lot of times you don't want to spend the time making pregens or if you do want to spend the time making it, you, you lose the information. Um, I ran a session at game hole for people who had never played Mork Borg before. So the sheets actually have all the information printed on them, adjusted for your stats and stuff like that. It's not a lot. It's not a, a game mechanics heavy system by any stretch of the imagination. 
but I got to be a little bit more creative with some of the things. Uh, the The book itself is 48 pages. I don't even remember. Um, but the PDF is the real sales part of that because I was able to do uh, blank sheets, um, low ink sheets, so you can print at home. Awesome. And uh, for online games, they're form fillable. So you can, you know, click in there, type your information, and you can use these things online because they've got all the, all the stuff able to be filled out. Um, and in addition to that, there is a pack of 30 of the pregens that has all the art from the book that I specifically commissioned from um, a guy in Eastern Europe who did all these and they are the full color excellent you know it's all the it's all the crazy Morkborg layout um, of the super art heavy kind of crazy tilted text and somewhat hard to read but you know very intense and i did all that myself yeah because because cool. i wanted to i i didn't know how to tell an art an artist how to lay it out so i just started doing it and then i just did the whole thing <laughs> so i i was i was as you were explaining i was wondering because before the um we started this i actually went to your youtube channel which has two videos <laughs> um and one of them is a short um of you flipping through the book um, the derelict's diary and um i wondered as as you were flipping through it i'm like oh you know did ski did skeeter do this layout because this is this is so mork board it's gorgeous oh, thank you i appreciate it yeah i really liked the aesthetic and um i'm terrible at giving artists art notes i you know i i mostly say hey this is my general idea wow me you can't really do that for Mark Borg. Yeah. I mean, you you have to be very specific how you want things. And there's a lot of, especially with the fonts and the layout and the design, that could get seriously monotonous and irritating. So I wanted to learn how to give notes to somebody for that. And then I, it ended up just being easier and faster for me to do it. And I did, you know, a couple of pages a day and just knocked it out and had to redo many pages many times but uh very happy with the way it turned out and this book is uh the physical book of derelict's diary is a little bit different i went with the wire o binding so you can it lays flat on the table so because there are tables to reference in the book it doesn't you know fold up and shut on you 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 lay it flat or you can fold it completely over and then it's easy to use that was i wanted it to be a tool that was usable at the table for conventions that was the goal very so, cool you know, so as, i was just i was just gonna say as somebody that that came up uh doing punk layouts mm -hmm. you 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 you've got it you've got this oh, <laughs> thank you coming from you that is high praise i appreciate a lot um uh, awesome so skeeter or uh, yeah sorry skeeter my brain yeah that's me <laughs> that's you um what uh can you tell me what programs do you do your layout in and stuff affinity affinity okay uh, i i use the affinity suite uh i have photo and publisher which i did <laughs> for the mork borg book i didn't even do in publisher every single one of those i just did in affinity photo and yeah. and they're just jpegs and and bam um i started messing with uh the publisher a little bit um but the book layout is not my thing yeah I, i'm sure i could figure it out and make it passable but as i have gotten advice from other people it would take me so long to do that my time is better spent writing and coming up with the concepts and then I can hand that off to people who are better, faster, and just more generally efficient than I am at it. And, and I think that's something that's really important to think about when you're a small indie publisher. I know Nick and I have talked about that in the past, just 
you know, not on the show, on the show as well, but in person, um, is knowing where your strengths lie, knowing the things that you as a person find fulfilling that are worth you pursuing, right? And right. Um, and then knowing when to hand it off to somebody because that's going to be a chore for you and you're willing to pay right. for that. That's kind yeah. of a that's kind of a big. I thought that was a really big lesson to learn uh, for so, me at the beginning. As as an example, our mutual friend Levi Combs from Planet X Games. Um, do we want Levi laying out a book, or do we want him writing these wacky stories and zines that he can just call into existence at the drop of a hat? Personally, I want him writing. Yeah. I don't want him spending his time laying out a book and I don't want me laying, laying out a book. You know, there, there are so many more qualified people who can take my idea, make it a physical item and make it so much better than I would that. Why would I hamstring my own product? Yeah, absolutely. So, so, I mean, there are definitely like I said, that's that you know that's you recognizing, hey, this is not my forte, but I still need it to look great, so I'm going to hire somebody to do that part. Yeah, and if I want to do you know an artistic passion project, which Derelict's Diary ended up being that, um, I wanted to get it out because I wanted to see a if I could do it, and I thought it was cool, yeah. and and I think the idea once more people see it. Uh, you know, it's an evergreen product. It's not going to go out of style. So it, uh, a year from now, if somebody wants it, I will probably still have some. So, uh, you know, they can still pick it up and it's still usable. That's the thing is it's not, you know, it's not version dependent or anything like that. There's no ticking time bomb on my stock out there in the garage. So um, it'll move. Yeah, it, it it has moved at conventions. So, yeah, and yeah. and that's another thing to think about is how much you know you have to weigh how much you purchase, and right. so how do you approach that? I mean, you've got these Kickstarters. Your numbers range. Uh, Derelict Diary was was the smallest one, sitting at about three grand, all the way up to almost ten thousand nine ninety two ninety three hundred. Um, you know, where where are are you constantly thinking about adjusting? How much you're going to buy, uh, you know, for, from print runs and things like this, or do you aim to just just barely make your minimums and then do a reorder down the road? What are your thoughts on that? So what I have done is my books are print on demand. Okay. So um, and it used to be print on demand was a pretty dirty word in publishing because couple of years ago the the quality wasn't really there especially with some some perfect bound books you know covers detach completely from the guts of the book and we've all got horror stories of, of getting you know shit books from even reputable giant publishers that own um the fifth edition of the world's most famous role-playing game you know the just the the stuff was crap but especially with the zine market i have found you're able to do a high quality product in small batches that way i don't you know it's just me i don't yeah. i don't have a team of people doing this um when orders are sent out it's either me or me and my wife and my son packing this i don't have a professional company doing it so you know i try to keep margins relatively small um which has been a problem sometimes for fulfilling orders but by doing the print on demand i'm able to get them quick enough that i can turn it around it's not like oh you ordered this now six months later i can get it to you i think i have a 30-day turnaround if i have no books i can get your order out yeah. by getting them and and getting them turned and that actually goes to the kickstarter thing as well um as far as figuring out how many books to get um the last two or three days of a kickstarter i kind of see where i'm at for pledgers and i you know i have a little 
a spreadsheet where I can figure out, okay, this person ordered, the, I, ha, I have to get this many books because of these pledge levels and this many books of these pledge levels and Goodman's going to want to buy some and, and this other company is going to want to buy some. So I figure it out generally add x percent or round up to the next number or something and then just get them and you know i have them until they sell yeah it like is that. it is not it is not a calculus it is a by the seat of my pants i estimate oh i'm gonna need this many and yeah uh especially for the valley out of time stuff i've had to do runs of okay this is a second printing or a third printing or or something like that for sure I just like that when you were gesticulating about your spreadsheet, it looked like you were like moving uh, an abacus around. <laughs> I, I am slightly better than a Luddite, but not, <laughs> not, you know, jumping to star speed there at all. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> I am so a I simple that's, animal. <laughs> that's, that's, a, you know, so this is a good overview of your general products. Can you talk about what's coming next other than Crypt 2 or? Uh, yeah, I'm doing another uh, series of books. And um, so Valley Out of Time was the homage to the the um, dinosaur movies. I had a whole little marquee across the top because I wanted the covers of my books to look like movie posters. Mm -hmm. And I got various of degrees of success with that. Some people were like, why did you do this? Um, but the next one is going to be Underland, and it is an environment where everything is underground. So, like those classic the the Drow series, um, all those uh, the Puatoa, you know, all of that stuff. But the idea is that in Underland, once you're underground, all of that is connected to everywhere else so if you if you are in you know the world of crypto the science wizard and you go underground and then you travel for a while and then you pop back up you could be in kryn you could be in forgotten realms uh you could take you could be in a sewer in water deep and you're underground and you go around a corner and you're in the dark and then all of a sudden you're in some rubble field underground in spelljammer space or something who knows but i i like the idea that once you go into a dark corner underground you can literally be anywhere because i i like the open-endedness of that i think sometimes people feel like they have to be constrained a little bit by uh by a campaign or an idea that they have and i want to kind of kick that in the butt well i mean that's a cool idea because there, there are actually very few campaign concepts that just say go play with everything you've got i mean the only game that i can think of that's really focused like that would be something like torg right um yeah. which was which was always you know multiple things coming in but this sounds almost like swiss cheese you know you're on yeah. a surface and you go underground yeah. and you don't know where you come out at I, I love the idea of a lot of campaigns are very two-dimensional. Mm -hmm. It's like you're going to go around and you're going to explore this world. Well, you don't go up or down very often. I mean, no, and it's, all, I totally and it's, agree all, with you. it's always like, and going up, you know, the, we always hear about, oh, the, the fantastical castle in the clouds, you know, but how many adventures like that are there? Yeah. I mean, there aren't that many. Um, underground is usually, oh, I'm, I'm going to get my dwarven companions and we're going to go underground and, and fight these, uh, whatever's, and then we're coming back out. What if you can't, Yeah, you know, and then once I got to that concept, I, th I thought, well, what are the psychological changes that would happen to you being an above ground race of people? humans and now you can't you're trapped underground you're not necessarily in peril but you can't see the sun the air doesn't move the same smells are completely different i mean your senses would be thrashed and 
you know, we have we have real world examples of people getting stuck in caves and and the epic levels of engineering to rescue those people just because, oh, yeah, they went spelunking and it rained. Well, now they're cut off from civilization. Yep. You know, and and what does that do to your brain? As adventurers, you know, you kind of don't necessarily think about that, but just the the stress and the claustrophobia and, you know, a, a, a simple thing like light. You know, if you're underground, unless you have copious amounts of resources, you're going to be in the dark. And you're in the dark in an environment that you don't know really anything about. And it's just, that's my taking the Lovecraft cosmic horror and sticking it underground. And we'll see how it goes. (laughs) It could blow up in my face. I don't know. Are you, are you envisioning this as another six part, six parter or? Um, It's going to be at least four. Um, I, I liked the idea of doing a small issue number one that kind of so people can buy something inexpensively and get some of the flavor and then maybe i think the you know at least books two through three will be a little bit bulkier uh i will not make the same mistake i made in uh valley out of time part five is way bigger than the rest of the books and i did not change the price so oops that was a uh, that was a business error but you know i'm my margins are not so tight that it's going to crush the company i'm you know i have a day job this isn't what i do all the time so i can beg some money from the credit card and put it in there to to pay for some things but i also get pretty ridiculous with art I have a bunch of stock art pieces that I've used and some of the covers for part five and six of Valley had to be specific. So I'm very happy with the way they turned out. Very cool. Well, this sounds like a great a couple of great projects you got coming out next year. Yeah, it's uh, I actually and that was another thing that I got from my good buddy Levi Combs is uh, make a schedule and plan out you know what you're gonna do when and i started doing that very quickly and i have two years like immediately already set so yeah i I found the same kind of thing the moment you start thinking about it it's you know you can lay down ideas and and if it's two years out you need to make that one thing three years out you can always slip something in if you need right For me, it was more, when should I release things to keep them relevant? Yeah. Like if I'm going to do another version of something I did before, it needs to be within a certain space or people are going to be like, oh yeah, I don't care about that anymore. I've moved on. So that's, that's what's helping me the most. Very good. Going back to your, uh, your underland, 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 underland. Yes. Uh, 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 where are you based out of again, Skeeter? Seattle. Seattle. Pacific Northwest. Okay. I'm a little bit north of Seattle. Because I, I was going to ask you if you've ever been to Mammoth Cave in Kentucky. I have not, but I've heard of it. Yeah, I, I would highly recommend if if you if you need some inspiration for everything you just discussed. It's like when I, I went there last year in the summer and I was like, oh my God, I'm in the underdark. Yeah. Um, it is, it is absolutely mind blowing. And one of the things that they, they, they do on one of the tours is they actually um, get everybody into this large cavern and then they turn out all the lights so you can get a sense of what the people that originally started exploring this cavern system. And they've, they've, they've uh, mapped out like 422 miles of underground cavern that's connected um which is just um, i'm i'm very glad that you told me they take you in there and turn the lights off because i would have to nope right out of there (laughs) i i am legitimately claustrophobic and when i'm in the dark that becomes anywhere that's not my house (laughs) 
Yeah, luck, <laughs> luckily when, when they do that, they they do it when you're in this giant wide open cavern in yeah. order to, uh, but yeah, it's- it's. I, I would it's, probably also have to be high as hell to get through there <laughs> just because I would lose my mind. Yeah, it's- yeah. It's it's a but, it's, it's an experience, but to that end, um, Seattle actually has something called the Underground Tour, mm -hmm. because when Seattle was originally founded, the whole city burned down and they built on top of it. Mm -hmm. So you can go to these things and you can go around and see the buildings that used to be there. And uh, we went this last summer and I took a bunch of pictures, That's just awesome. of random stuff. So there will be stone walls that will be shown in underland that are actual physical walls from seattle That's that awesome. i'm gonna just kind of alter to put in there so if, yeah you know if you ever get uh work working with that I, so i've been to carlsbad ca caverns and then oh. there's a, another cavern sister by a system by uh mass virginia that i've been to and and they are crazy cool to go check out uh, but you're right i'm a i'm only mildly claustrophobic <laughs> but um but I, I definitely can, I cannot watch cave movies, right? I, mean, I have to just like, no, no, I'm, I'm done. Well, the thing that always gets me is these people who go into these spelunking things and they get to this little tiny crack between yeah. these stones and like, oh yeah, I got to squeeze through there. And I'm like, the hell you do? That's the <laughs> last thing I Because I mean, if, if, I get, if I get my head through there, and I get my chest through there and my gut gets hung up and now I'm stuck. Yeah. I would just have a heart attack. You don't even have to rescue me. I would yep. just burst. <laughs> yeah. Um, and another thing, uh, you know, um, I was in uh, Edinburgh. I've been there a couple of times and there's um, something called um, Mary's close. Mary's close is a tour. Um, the, 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 the the core of Edinburgh is built on a spine of a hill. You have Castle yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like Edinburgh Castle at the top, and you mm -hmm. go down the Royal Mile. At the bottom is a Holyrood, or uh, which is now the Queen's residence, or was the Queen's residence. It was originally a monastery, and there's a spine there. And they built all of these things called closes off the side. So all these side streets oh, wow. basically went straight down to the lock. <laughs> <laughs> and, and 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 you could i mean and it was like a 45 to 60 degree angle straight down oh, what they did was over the centuries those got built on top of each other yeah and when you go now um you can't see any of that that's all been covered over um and so so you know edinburgh looks really flat it, it's tilted but broad yeah. and you can go in, down into mary's close and they have all of the they, they've opened up the close and you can see down this what is what looks like a it looks like you're looking when you are, you're looking between two buildings. They're only about 10 feet wide, but they go like hundreds and hundreds of feet down the hill. Yeah. And they're like 10 stories high. And, um, and so you go down through this and they're like, well, so we know this was built in the 1400s and this part was built in the 1600s. And, and they take you all the way through this to, you know, it's really, really fascinating. Um, one, another one of the things that we've done because you know i am claustrophobic and i have to have these safety measures is if you go to any giant metropolis city yeah and and then walk down an alley yep especially at dusk that was that was the best time it ever happened to me is if you can get a one lane alley with some buildings that are you know eight ten stories high and then stop in the middle and then just look up to see how much sky you can see it is really an interesting perspective yeah it, it's like dying in a well so i think i think you got a cool concept there and there's yeah. so yeah i, I cool. hope it works out yeah all right we, we went on a on a tangent yeah we um, did so let's we're, we're, we're gonna pull it back into kickstarter Okay. Um, so, um, so looking at uh, all of the different Kickstarters that you've done, um, and the the range of of amount of backers and and things, um, one of the first questions that comes to comes to mind is um, going forward. What type, you know? Do you do pre launch notifications? How much time do you give it? Um, you know, have you developed a system for preparing people for your next Kickstarter? Yeah, um, Kickstarter has its own tools. The, the 
pre-launch page, which is a, a free tool that everyone should be taking advantage of, plaster that all over social media. Um, I, as we have been talking about, I am not great with social media. So there are some etiquette things that I have trouble with. You can't barrage people with, with your begging for them to look at your, your product that, that has absolutely the opposite effect you want, but you do need to cast a wide net. Mm. So, um, you know, Kickstarter has their uh, pre-launch page. I have been getting into Backerkit, and Backerkit has uh, email campaigns that you can automate. Um, so you can list all the people from any Kickstarter you've ever had before, put those emails into this launch, and it sends a, hey, Skeeter Green Productions has another Kickstarter launching in X amount of days, and here go to this link and it it sends you to it um so i started doing that um with again levi combs planet x games help i've been getting into more kickstarter funding and backing groups um really the advice is uh spread it out to as many people as you can yeah. without being irritating um, the, especially with my Valley out of time, it was a very low dollar pledge to get the books and I didn't have any stretch goals. So I can't extract more money out of pledgers. I need more pledgers. Yeah. Right. So, so that has been the focus and that's really just, I think, good advice for anybody um, because even if the people who hear about your campaign don't back the one that you're talking about now, maybe something later piques their interest yeah. or they, they, you never know who is randomly just, oh yeah, I've got 50 extra bucks. What am I going to do with it? Hey, let's go to Kickstarter and see what's floating around there. Yeah. Um, so you gotta, you gotta be able to jump on those things. So yeah, I would say get as many pre-launch notifications out there um go on podcasts get with anybody who has a social media channel and beg borrow or steal their time um just getting your name out to more people is how you have a successful kickstarter yeah i'm i have a, a specific question for you regarding backer kit because I have, I have always used um, the uh, the Kickstarter's own system for um, managing mm -hmm. pledges and getting yep. rewards out. Um, Backer Kit, as I understood it, uh, takes like an extra ten percent, uh, like five to ten percent out of out of your funds in order to use their system. That's the way I understand it, anyway. Um, and so I always took all of my email addresses and dumped them into Mailchimp. Um, in order right. to send out mass mass right. emails, um, so is that feature um, that uh, you were talking about with back backer kit? Is that something that is like built into? Hey, you know, by by having spent money to use backer kit, this is just built in. This is something, or is that an additional fee? <clears throat> um, some of the tools have different fees. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have not used the backer kit pledge manager yet. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to be using it for um, my Kickstarter that just closed. So I'll be able to figure out some of that. Now, as far as the backer kit feature, I wanted to do that specifically because that's where I can charge postage. So I can be much more specific since, especially since we're in the holiday time, uh, I'm not going to have the books before the holiday rates increase. Mm -hmm. So there is a certain time where the, in January, where the rates go back to normal. And that's where I want to um, send everybody's rewards is mm -hmm. after that time. So I can save people, you know, and I think it's like 70 cents, but still, yeah, that's, I want to be aware of those things. Now, in that portion of backer kit, when you can add on to your pledge, 
Uh, it's my understanding that backer kit takes like 3% of those funds. Okay. So, so it is, it is just extra money and that's how backer kit gets paid. Yeah. Um, and I'll be able to tell you more once I actually <laughs> pull the trigger and do it. Um, as far as the pre-launch email blasts, mm -hmm. uh, I know the, I know the first one, the first one's free. Uh, you could just go ahead and do it. There is, I do uh, it. yeah, there is like a 48 hour point where you can hit the button and send out another blast. And that is $99 mm -hmm. to, to get that one. And I have done it three times. And every time I have done it, I have at least recouped and gotten a hundred percent. So I've, I've gotten more than $200 for that hundred dollar investment mm -hmm. uh so it's it has paid for itself and i feel like it has increased the reach a little bit because i get you know 20 25 more backers once i do that and whether that's a it reached somebody or it just joggled somebody to actually push the button and go for it i'm not sure mm -hmm. but it it has been value added so so um question uh, did you use that on valley out of time one and two because i'm looking at your backer numbers and valley out of time one and two was your your peak number of backers you had 405 right. backers um so yeah was, was that something that you used on that particular one yeah i did the i did the pre-launch emails i did the um I did the last 48 hour blast email. And of course I've done, you know, you do the, you do the summary emails and updates and blasts and all that stuff. And I, I usually do my Kickstarters for about three weeks mm -hmm. and I try to either have an update or some kind of communication every three to four days just so I don't barrage people and, and turn them off, but I still want them to know, Hey, this is a living and breathing project. I'm not just telling you, give me your money. And then I'll let you know when you can have a product, you know, I don't want to be that way about it. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've gotten pretty good engagement when people have asked me questions. I try, I'm in front of a computer screen, like 24 hours a day, practically, uh, so when people ask me a question, it's, you know, an hour or two, I can respond. Uh, sometimes the questions are very relevant. Sometimes they're stupid. Um, but You're not even to see that, <laughs> well, no, but I mean, sometimes people are shitty Yeah. in, in the comments. It, I mean, yeah. if you've run a Kickstarter and you haven't gotten a shitty comment, man, God bless you. You're doing way better than me. Yep. Um, but, you know, they're not always intentionally mean. A lot of times they're just people don't understand how things are worded mm -hmm. in the Kickstarter because I, I, I write it so I understand it. And then I send it to other people like, hey, can you read this? Do you understand what I'm going for? And every single time they're like, what does this mean? And I'm like, that's totally clear. It's totally well, I, clear because I have a visual image of what I'm trying to say, but somebody who doesn't have any knowledge of what my project is, it's absolutely not clear. Yeah, you know, I, I noticed that um, uh, looking at your uh, looking at your Kickstarters, um, 13 reward tiers, 12 reward tiers, six reward tiers. 13, 14, 7, 13. Um, so I can see where, where somebody might have questions yeah. because there's so many options. <laughs> well, and that's that's because I am not well versed with backer kit after the fact. Yeah. Uh, so I I tried to figure out all the combinations of how people could buy books mm -hmm. and put them as a pledge tier. So if they just click it, they don't have to tell me later what game system. So that's that's something I should clarify. In Valley at a Time, I have released two books per Kickstarter, and each of the two books is available in Swords and Wizardry or 
DCC MCC mashup. So the combination of what somebody can get is pretty vast and sending out a survey and saying, hey, clarify what you want to buy from me, I felt like was was undue pressure on the consumer. Mm -hmm. I wanted I wanted it to make it very easy. Hey, point at the menu and tell me what you want. Mm -hmm. You know, because I would appreciate that as a buyer. Right. You know, that's that's how I figure out what pledge levels I want for things. Is I I scroll through everybody's stuff and go to the pledge level explanation and go, okay, that's the one that I want, and then I find it over there. Um, and then later when add-ons are available, I'm usually like, oh well, shit, I should get that too. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's 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 like the magazines at the grocery store, you know. You know, one, one, one of the things that's that's funny for me is that when I go through, if I see that many options, I'm like, wait, what? And then I'm like trying to find where I see like the most number of backers. And then I read that one. Yeah. <laughs> because, yeah. Because no, that's and clearly, that... clearly the one that every uh, that everyone's going for, because it is the the obvious one. Right. And, um, you know, in the in the chat one of the uh, questions was give us an example of a stupid question <laughs> so uh what can be a stupid question is i have a pledge level that says all the books and it says you get a copy of for example part five and part six in swords and wizardry and dcc four total books and then i'll get the question well how many books are in this pledge like well there there's four. Oh, this isn't the previous kickstarters books as well which once they explain what's going on it's like oh yeah that is a valid question so that's not a stupid question and i just thought it was yeah. except for the fact that it says you get four books in this pledge so so that's petty on my part and i know it but yeah i, I did you know I did, those things happen i did notice when i was going through because I, I did check because when I saw all all the books, um, I looked to see if it was one, two, three, four, five, and six. Um, yeah, I uh, for the next series, when I put all the books, it will say all the books in this Kickstarter. Yes. So so it's a little bit clear. And and those are some live and learn things. Yeah. Like that, you know, all the books make sense in my head that it would be the books right here. Mm. But there are a lot of Kickstarters that say, all our titles yeah. and, and they go through every book they've ever published. And yeah. I mean, Guilty. I don't want to, I don't want to confuse things that much. Yeah. I could do that for PDFs, yeah, but man, not for physical books. Yeah. yeah I, 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 uh, I've, I've never had 13 or 14 tiers, but I used to have a good six to 10 and I, I used to get several comments every Kickstarter with confusion. And so I've really tried constraining down tears um, and it's, it is hard. And, you know, and for I, things like uh, Crypt of the Science Wizard 2 will not have 13 tiers. Yeah. It, it'll have, you know, maybe six at yeah. total. And that's if I come up with something crazy to add in there. But yeah, yeah usually, it, usually it's a tier for PDF only for international buyers because international shipping is such a nightmare. Uh, and then physical book plus PDF, and then potentially, you know, signed physical book or something special with the physical book or something like that. And then there's usually, and this ties into a question that Nick had for me before we even got on. Uh, sometimes there will be a crazy like, hey, for $500, I'll run a game for you. Yeah. You know, there there's those kind of things. And that is actually what I found out in my first Kickstarter or the, for Crypt of the Science Wizard. There's a big dip in my in my money because most of my Kickstarters do, you know, do the first day jump. And then I have been very fortunate. I have a very slow but gradually rising through the entire Kickstarter. I don't do the saw blade too much. But in my first one, it has a big dip right there. And I looked at what it was. It was a pledger uh, giving up a $500 pledge for me to run a game. 
because I mean, they probably figured out it was ridiculous, <laughs> yeah. but, but that, that can put a serious change in your trajectory. Um, especially when it's up front, because that that's a hole you got to dig out of. Yeah. And I, again, have been very fortunate. Um, and this was something that Trevor pointed out to me one time when we were talking about Kickstarters is that I do have the jump and then another jump. And then that I don't have the the gutter where everybody figured out, oh, this guy can't write. <laughs> you know, I I don't I I have avoided that. So yeah, I've I've had a couple of days, you know, it, and it's usually I don't know if it's Kickstarter fatigue. Um clearly, you know, I mean, obviously people who are backing you probably are not hopefully, hopefully not paying as close attention to it as you are, right? Because when a Kickstarter is running, I don't know about you guys, but it's like I check it every couple of hours. I mean, you know, in the first couple of days, I check it oh, yeah. every hour, right? Yeah. And, uh, but I've seen um, add-ons can be a problem for me where, uh, you know, we'll have, I mean, if, if you add up all the add-ons on a normal smoking worm Kickstarter, there are people who are pledging sometimes 250 plus dollars, which is wonderful. Don't get me wrong. But I've had a couple of uh, days where like two or three people suddenly shift. Yeah. And, and maybe... And you know what it is, and I've had this happen in the middle of the Kickstarter where I'm just a backer and on on Tuesday, everything looked hunky-dory and great. You know, I had the money, everything was going great. And then on Saturday, you know, you blow three tires and you're like, oh my God, I need to buy some tires, you know? And so and I, I legitimately had um, a backer for one of the Kickstarters and I, I kind of knew him and uh, they had always been really good. Yeah, I'm going to take the top tier and, and you know, get all this stuff. And I saw, you know, a kind of a, a downswing and I figured out that this, you know, got in contact with the person. I was like, hey, if you don't mind, can you just tell me like why you backed out? And they had a medical issue. Emergent. Yeah. Um, and it was emergent and they were just like, hey, you know, uh, give me the information. I'll buy the book later. You know, I just can't commit to it right now. And I'm like, totally, no, take care of your business. When the Kickstarter was over, I just sent them books just because, you know, I, it was the right thing to do. Yeah. You know, the, this is a game. You know, when, when people are deciding, hey, uh, you know, I feel bad because we had a medical issue in our family and now I can't support your hobby writing thing of like no please just take it if it makes anything better it is totally worth it to me yeah so there there's you got to be aware of people's situations yeah or yeah. as aware as you can be right and 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 you know you watch those backers you know drop either they reduce their number you know what they're backing you for or or they have to cancel out altogether and you just have to realize you know, situation, something has probably happened for that person and they have a, right. And, and obviously they have the right to back out whenever they want. Right. It's oh, like, sure. Yeah, sure. So, that, that's one of the things that I think some larger companies forget sometimes is, especially if you have a very established fan base, mm -hmm. you can be lulled into the, oh yeah, I'm going to get 500 backers. And then you get like 300 and you get, well, where the F are, where is everybody? Oh, well, we're having a zine quest at the same time as Gen Con. So yeah, people aren't backing your stuff because they're spending money over here. And it's not always, you know, it's not always immediately apparent why things are going but the economy has been so crazy the fact that any people are backing any role-playing stuff i just like i would i would do the prayer hands but i hate it when people do that so <laughs> you know but I mean, I'll, I'll do the appreciation face yeah thank you but i mean it is true because i mean rpgs on kickstarter remain one of the most you know um uh, backed projects there are you know one of the most overall as a as a category one of the most lucrative there is yeah if you're not doing a board game uh tabletop role playing is is just has been such a benefit yeah 
uh, crowdfunding. And, you know, we're, we're talking about Kickstarter because that's what I'm familiar with. It's the same kind of goes for Indiegogo or any of the other crowdfunding sites. Um, a lot of this is universal. There are slight differences to all of them, but yeah, you gotta, you gotta be paying attention. Yeah. Do you pay attention to? Nope. I can every... stop you right there. Nope. <laughs> uh, very, very rarely. <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> so do you, do you pay attention to average pledge amount? Um, not really. No. Um, my, and again, I keep bringing him up. My man, Levi Combs, he was one of the people that really got me off of looking at the, the total amount of funds raised and look at the backer number. Yeah. Cause the amount of funds raised is, I mean, it's relevant because that's, what's funding your project, but you always want that backer number at least close or rising that that's the goal and unfortunately mine have kind of been going sort of all over the place which is why i need to do a more concerted effort to to work the social media and that outreach that i was talking about before you know, one, one of the things that I was reflecting on looking at your numbers, because looking at Valley out of time, one, and two, three, and four, and five, and six, um, like when you, when you take that as a whole, that's incredible. Um, but obviously Valley out of time, uh, one and two had the most backers, but there are those people that um, are going to be like, oh, why would I back three and four if I don't have one and two? Um, and so I'm sure that there are some, some people that would, when you by the time you get to five and six that's why you're going to see it goes from 405 to 347 to 313 right you're going to have a certain amount of that going on yeah um and i still have the books and uh especially for valley five and six when i get backer kit up it will be possible to buy the previous issues they will be available in that um one of the things that skews the numbers a little bit is for Valley five and six, I did not include postage in the pledge. Oh, okay. Um, I had been doing that before because I wanted people to have, once you push the button and you've committed your money, that's it. You're, you're done. I don't have to mess with you anymore. So that number, so the, the first two Valley Kickstarters literally did almost exactly the same amount. They're $32 yeah. uh, difference. Uh, Valley five and six dropped down, you know, quite a bit, but I'm also missing approximately $1,800 of postage that I would have there also, which puts it much closer to the same as the other two. Um, so yeah, that that's, again, it's, it's paying attention to the numbers and then figuring out what the numbers mean. And yeah, generally what I focus on is, is the pledge numbers, the number of pledgers. Number of pledgers. Do you look at follower conversion rate? You know? uh, I have, I have started doing that more. Um, and I have, again, been very fortunate uh, for, let's see if I can find the last one. The conversion rate was like 40 something percent, which I was ecstatic about. Yeah. Um, uh, another one of our mutual compadres, Jim Wampler, uh, has, has done extensive math work on you know, what you want to be. And really anything over 30% is a pretty good turnaround. Yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, so getting up into the forties, I was blown away and super happy, which means I just need to get the reach extended before, um, before it even starts. Yeah. You know, it's the one thing that, that uh, I don't know if it's, you know, it's always, it's one thing I've always wondered, you know, Kickstarter sends, these are people who have hit the, the like button, the love button, 
And they've said, I want to be informed about this in the last 48 hours. And it's a very big shame. I think it's a missed opportunity on Kickstarter's part to not let us customize a message that we send to people and say, hey, you may not have heard about, you know, you may have may have hit that button very early in the campaign and don't know that we hit a couple stretch goals or, you know, that it would be really nice if we, it doesn't have to be a lot of words, right? But if we could put a little blurb in there and actually talk about I th- it. I think that is assumed in the updates. Yeah. Like if you are the creator getting this going, you are going to take the responsibility to keep people updated. Yeah. Um, but I agree with you. I, if there was, even if there was a mid campaign, uh, email pop that went out to people who may have signed up for that pre-launch page, I don't think that would be hard to do. And I think that would be a huge benefit and, yeah. you know, Kickstarter's model is they get their percentage off of what you make. So it's in their best interest for you to make a lot of money. Although after the uh, after some of the board games, they may not be too worried about their paychecks because <laughs> that's true. bringing in a lot of money for doing nothing. Yeah. yeah. But I but I love my Kickstarter overlords, and please do not take my criticism <laughs> as derision in any way. <laughs> um. So one of the things that I've come to rely on a lot uh, since they started using it, which was only the last two Kickstarters for me is the fulfillment option at the very end of the of the kickstarter menus they have a category called fulfillment have you guys explored this i use it all the time yeah yeah it's it's absolutely essential so if you create items and then populate them into add-ons and then into your reward tiers you can actually track every individual i know i need x number of this Mm -hmm. because that's what what has been fulfilled for what i promised and i find that that is the most important metric you know, other after backer number, I go and spend a lot of time during a campaign looking at those numbers and making sure I'm hitting, um, you know, the right numbers I need for individual things in my campaign right. to make Absolutely. sure that I can, I can afford to pay for them. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so, I mean, you know, because sometimes you price something in a, in a somewhat risky position if you, you know, don't get X number. And, um, and so, yeah, so that's a, you know, it's a, I often, look at those numbers and think you know oh this is a little lower than i'd like it to be and i might then highlight that in an update and say hey guys just and i know that most people don't you know there's a high percentage of people who don't look at updates they just they fire and forget you know i'm back i'm good and and they're not going to look at it but there there must be some people and and sometimes it generates very good conversations uh i've noticed so i i do also oh yeah the, the number of people who like updates you know hit the like button on it and the number of people who comment on it you want that to be as as high as possible, but yeah, it's it's good that other people are using that too because I just found it to be, I think it is probably the number one advancement on the Kickstarter platform in the last year. Um, yeah, oh, for really, sure, the ability yeah. to to you know look and say, oh, I, I need num- I need seventeen of this, and I need twenty two of that, and I need thirteen of that. That's um, that's actually how I knew I had to do reprints. Yes, um, that's exactly because- right. Because and, of the fact that I, I look, looked at it and I was like, oh, wait, I, I need 50 more copies of this. Um, uh, right. I only got 25. Yeah. And and that is that is something you do not want to find out. You know, if you are a small publisher and you're doing the shipping yourself, you do not want to be putting books in mailers and go, oh, shit, I'm five short. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that is that is an uncomfortable feeling. Yeah, like, I, I'm sorry, I, I can't ship you your book. I'm an idiot. Fortunately, I have enough people I know who back my books. If I have a problem, I can rely on them. Hey, man, can I hand deliver it to you at the convention? I'm going to see you at in, in two months. Oh, yeah, it's fine. I'm not going to use your damn book. I just wanted to buy it to be supportive. I mean, those are the kind of friends <laughs> I have. It's like, I'm not buying your shit. <laughs> like, what? uh but no that um and actually uh talking about the updates i think i think for creators who are established and have a style that they run their kickstarters and their update um habits 
I, I think then people are a little bit more able to decide if they even need to look at your updates. Like I put pieces of art in the update. Mm -hmm. Okay, you bought the book. Here's what's finished. Here's something I can now show you because we're, we're at this point just to make it interesting. So people do want to do that. I put links to other people's Kickstarters in there, just kind of trying to make the whole network thing move. Because if I can, if I can ship two more people to Trevor's Kickstarter, that's good for all of us. Yeah. You know, so yeah, there, there, there's definitely a lot. Again, it goes back to the network, you know, cast that wide net as much as you can get, get as many people um, out there to, to pick up your book as you can. Yeah, well, and, what, and the conversion rate thing, you know, if you're getting 30 or 40% of the people who sign up for your pre-launch page actually back, then you know, you want to have five, six hundred, a thousand people so you can get a bulk of those people and rely on their pledges. Yeah, yeah Nick, you were going to say something? Yeah, I was going to say one, one of the things that when uh, I first started running Kickstarters, I read all of the, um, I don't know if either of you are familiar with Stonemeyer Games, um, the makers of Wingspan and uh, Viticulture and a bunch of other board games. But they, they the um, Jamie Stegmeyer, the guy who runs Stonemeyer Games, uh, he did like a whole series, of like 150 blog posts all about running Kickstarters. And I read all of them. And I was, one of the things that he really, really hyped was engagement and trying to get people to comment. And one of the things that I found is that I basically started to make myself crazy trying to get people to comment. And it was actually kind of reassuring looking at your numbers, um, Skeeter, just now, because I was, I was looking and I was like, oh, you, you get the same number of comments that I do, which is like one every, every so many days. Um, yeah. And, and I kind of, I'm of two minds of that because if, if not a lot of people are commenting, then I think the Kickstarter is clear and people are able to get what they want. Mm -hmm. If the majority of the comments are positive and encouraging, that means people like the product enough to actually say something about it, yeah. which, is, which is hard. It's way harder to praise something than it is to shit on it. Um, I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble for swearing on the good yeah, game. You Sorry. dropped a lot of S-bombs. Yeah, I, I, will, <laughs> I will stop doing it now. I forget sometimes. Um, but yeah, the Goodman crew is just going to go, man, Skeeter, why, why can't you? Um, but I, it's very, I've been, again, very fortunate. I haven't had a lot of direct attacks in the comments because you can never get rid of those. Yeah, they're, they're trying to get some functionality. So if somebody wants to come in and, and be rude or just abusive in there, it stays. Um, they're trying to get some functionality where you can get some of those removed, but that hasn't happened yet. Mm. So the comments, I'm not, I'm not too worried or concerned about. Uh, if they are questions, I definitely want to jump on it and not have those things sitting out there because I think that gives more of an impression of an engaged creator who's not just, oh, I got your money. I'm out. Yeah. You know, I definitely do not want to have that look. Yeah. So before we finish, finish my section, there was one question that I added that uh, I wanted to ask about because like with Crypto the Science Wizard, you released Crypto the Science Wizard for what? Three different systems? Four different yeah. systems? It is um, three. Uh, yeah, because MCC and DCC are- Yeah, I merged yeah. MCC and yeah. DCC. So that that only takes up one spot in my system brain. Um, I could but I, one game. 
but I did, I did, I did notice that uh, um, one of your your go tos is swords and wizardry. You know, how do you feel that um, offering multiple systems has been for you as a creator? Do you feel that it is a beneficial thing to do? And uh, playing off of that, also, why not OSE? Can can you give me some? Um, so, I have. I have always told people that game mechanics are not important uh, for a module or a scenario. The story is what's important. You don't, you don't play D and D or fantasy role playing because you want to roll certain dice uh, for four hours or however long you play, you want to be involved in a story. Mm. So I, I want to make it easier for people to enjoy the stories. And some people are, are hard baked into the, I'm only going to play DCC or I'm only going to play swords and wizardry, or I'm only going to play fifth edition, uh, whether it's for comfort or whether that just, you know, scratches their itch for gaming. So I like to release things for multiple rule sets because it does give me the wider audience mm -hmm. um and as far as swords and wizardry and ose i swords and wizardry is more what i have always played mm -hmm. so i i mean that's like the back of my hand for for swords and wizardry um i've gotten a lot of great help with DCC and MCC conversions and people checking the math and, you know, what I was most terrified of when I went to the DCC conversion for uh, Crypt of the Science Wizard is I didn't want it to come off like, oh, this was something for fifth edition and they scrubbed a few numbers and now, you know, trying to release it for DCC. Yeah. You can do that but it's crap. Yeah. What you have to do is you have to rewrite it in the vernacular of the game mechanics you are using because the disrespect to the people who are buying it for that game mechanics is palpable. I mean, it's just like, oh, you didn't even care enough to learn the system that you're releasing this for. And, you know, it's not always that psychological, but there is an element to that. You know, if if a, a hardcore DCC player opens a module and it's talking about the GM or something like that, they're going to be mad. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, no, that's not what we use. You know, if you if you present a skill check incorrectly, like wildly incorrectly, it's like, does this person even know the game? Why am I buying this product for my system? You know, they get very possessive about that. Yeah. Um, Fandom. O OSE is a great system. I, I, I actually love the way it's laid out and presented. Um, I can't go back to basic. Mm -hmm. that, that's just, I, I have tried. I love playing it. I don't want to write for that system and it is close enough to swords and wizardry. It's a very easy conversion both ways, you know, same DCC and MCC are different in certain spots significantly enough from swords and wizardry. I don't want to just write something and say, right, convert it, you know, yeah. and I don't want an appendix in the back saying, Oh, here are the monsters for DCC because then all that writing is different. Yep. You know, it has to, it has to be done right. And it's not always easy or it's not quick, but it's the right thing to do. Yeah. I, I, I part of the question was to, 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 to see, because obviously you, you get yourself to a much wider audience, but you actually chose the systems that your heart is in, as opposed to just going for the one that's going to, bring in the most money so yeah uh crypt of the science wizard i actually wrote for fifth edition i wrote it with those rules in mind and i wanted to see that that was kind of a tester module to see that was when i was leaving frog god games 
And I wanted to see if I could put out a good module or if I was able to write only because I had a great team behind me. Um, so that was a personal kind of proving ground. And between the the fifth edition and the Swords and Wizardry and then later the DCC conversion and the reception I've gotten that, I think I know how to write a module. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about Kickstarter, a little bit about backer kit, you know, metrics you might look at and things like this and things you don't look at, all valid points. Um, you know, one of the things that we've we've kind of moved through the conversation is is this marketing issue. You, you've mentioned that you're learn, you know, this is something that you feel you're you're wanting to learn more about. Yeah. Um, that you feel, I mean, I think you told us before the show, I don't want to put words in your mouth that you know, definitely this is something you see as something that you have growth potential in. Oh, um, for sure. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, I'm I am not good at marketing self-promote self-promotion or any of that i i am one of those people that suffers badly from imposter syndrome mm -hmm. so so i sit here and think why would anybody buy my books you know uh, and i uh, the more that i bring that up the more that i find so many other people have that to a degree uh, oh i think everybody know. does yeah if varying know, degree i wonder i wonder about you <laughs> i mean, I mean like, I, I don't think uh, Zeb Cook is too worried about, you know, being able to write um, Ed Greenwood. Yeah, I think we're pretty confirmed we like Ed's stuff. So, but again, sometimes they have writer's block yeah. or, or, or another issue. So it's not uncommon to run into this. Uh, but yeah, marketing and social media, getting the word out, I I definitely need to improve on. So if you were to take just a moment to reflect, um, what are the three things you think you are, are wanting to focus on improving about marketing and getting, you know, in social media and everything to you, what are the thing, things that you hear Levi Combs mentioning or Jim Wampler or, you know, Jeffrey, uh, you know, Talanian or something Talanian. like that. Um, um Wow. You're actually making me think about that one. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is the interlude portion. Please get up and have a drink <laughs> while I think about things. Um, I, I think it's more of me being clear to people what I'm offering. Um, sometimes I forget that with all the voices in my head, that's not the people buying my books. Yeah. So, so the internal conversations I have where I've explicitly gone through all of this stuff, nobody else is privy to that conversation. And, and I don't always remember that. Um, the, and there are times I will use the Mork Borg Kickstarter as an example. There was a healthy dose of arrogance I went into that with because I thought I could sell a new book in a new system strictly off my name. I thought I would have two, 300 backers just because I'm Skeeter Green, damn it. You know, I, I thought that carried more weight and I was quite humbled to, to find out the Kickstarter was hey, we don't really understand what this product is or what you're doing, so I'm not going to back it. And it's totally valid. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't necessarily do it if I was in a different position. So being clear, getting the word out, um, not just advertising on Facebook, um, not just advertising to friends and friends of friends who already know that I'm releasing something, you know, I got to get out there. Um, for the last Kickstarter, I started doing some Facebook ads because I had heard from half a dozen people that, yeah, targeted ads at least make their money back. Plus you're getting a little bit more spread. And I made some money off that too. You know, it paid for itself and I made some money. So there are a lot of things that 
uh, when I tell people, hey, I found this thing. And they're like, you are so behind the curve on, on marketing. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's awful. Um, and unfortunately, there have been some companies and some people in tabletop that are great about marketing and not good about providing a product or paying their freelancers. But I, that's probably a subject we don't want to talk about <laughs> tonight. Um, if anybody in the chat wants to hear my snarky attitude about that, talk to me at a convention. Somebody, somebody commented that uh, they they bought your Morkborg release just because they like your DCC work and they don't actually have Morkborg. You know? Oh, <laughs> wow. That's awesome. And thank you so much. I appreciate that. I will run a Morkborg game for you if you catch me at a convention. Yeah. I found it's an interesting system. It, it's really stripped down. It's really short. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like a board game, it felt like to me. Um, yeah, it can. It's... Uh, and it's not for everyone. I mean, yeah. the, the entire premise of Morkborg is like the world is ending in, in two to six days. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, the, the end times are nigh. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's very, you know, guttural kind of, kind of how you play uh, in the derelicts diary. I, I came up with some new weapons for sort of a, you know, grungy apocalyptic, type game and and one of my favorite ones is your weapon is a jar of bees <laughs> you know? that's pretty good you I know you that. you can you one of your weapons is a dead cat that yeah. you can only use x amount of times and then it you know falls apart so, yeah so there there's weird there's weird stuff like that uh the the one of the biggest advantages is it is so stripped down it's an excellent convention game yeah. you're not bogged down in rules you are playing more often i ran a, a two-hour game at game hole for the new people that i talked about before we were cracking up the entire time i'm doing funny voices and these people are in horrible situations but you know everybody was having a good time and that was that was what was important is I mean, people who were initially afraid to even try a game left that game like with tears running down their face because they enjoyed it and were laughing and we all just had a good time. And that's the magic of role-playing, right? I'm, that I'm is sure it. That's why we do this. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. I, I ran a game at Gary Khan, and this is the first time when the game was over, uh, everybody clapped. That's and awesome. I will never forget that my entire life. And they're all people that I know. Yeah. So to have them be that enthused about the game and that invested and enjoying it that much, that was the best game in decades for me. Yeah, the, the history professor wants to know if you're going to be at Gary Con this year. I am not going to be at Gary Con this year. Uh, but if you get the opportunity check out the U2 King Cthulhu team because they are running the Dread from Geneva Lake, which is the adventure that I wrote with Luke for this year's Gary Con 14. They're, they're taking it on and, and they're going to have multiple slots of that. And their, their team is amazing. They have screens for stuff that pops up and they're very interactive and very enthusiastic. So check it out yeah absolutely well cool so um you know you one of the things i noticed that actually i really liked about crypt the science wizard um was you had the soft back and everything um you had your you had your um you know your tomb of horrors kind of uh, art book that had the uh, images I'm, I'm a big fan of that type of stuff um and you had a nice uh, you had a nice hardback as well um, I backed for the hardback and um, and certainly don't regret it. Um, although most hardbacks I go for need to be Smith sewn. This one's small enough that I don't think it's going to come apart too yeah. terribly bad. Um, I I have had I've had very good luck. Uh, the first books that I got for the hardbacks, uh, I still have two that I kept for myself, and 
uh, I use those to reference and every once in a while and they're holding up. Yeah. I mean, I mean, granted it's only been what a couple of years, but you know, as long as you're not defending yourself with the book, I think it's, I think <laughs> uh, print on demand has gotten a lot better. Um, much more uh, not archival quality or anything like that, but these, these will be books we'll have for 10 or 15 years or 20 years. Yeah, I mean, easily. Right. And, and, yeah. and, and like you pointed out, um, you know, it's not just print on demand that sometimes gets a bum set of books. Right. I mean, I seem to recall that Pathfinder had a really bad run on their first. Oh, practice. you just went out there and went there. Okay. Um, <laughs> Um, which yes. was not their fault that was a binder problem right i mean well so... i mean uh, okay so you did that one i'll do it watsi screwed the pooch on a couple of their books yep, yep. big time i mean and games and those were those were core rule books that they had to replace yeah so yeah, yeah. i mean it can happen it, it basically just depends it's literally rolling the dice no you're absolutely right i mean uh, like i was i was about to say games workshops um first printing of uh of uh warhammer 40,000 um horrible horrible reputation for falling apart yeah i, I mean, mean if you can find one intact that's a first printing you are a lucky person and you will probably never want to open it are you uh, rogue trader rogue trader yeah okay. my unearthed arcana from tsr back in the day uh i god before i had to throw it away i think that was in like 22 individual pieces yeah. front cover back cover spine bunch of the smith sewing was torn up yeah it was it was awful yeah but i kept it like a little libram all together <laughs> rubber band around it yeah. yeah so i didn't lose any of the pages um and 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 so so the hardback i felt like i said was great um to me that felt like a special print reward like that was a you know, your one-time kind of option. Do you do you do do many of those, or, or have you just focused on softbacks after that? Uh, Crypto Codex had a hardback version, um, the the right. monster book, and uh, Science Wizard Two will have a hardback version. And I'm toying with the idea. I batted this around to some people, and they I got various levels of yay or nay. Uh, I'm thinking about having it be the same cover, but a different color. I think that's a wonderful idea. Because that, if it's, a, it's exactly the same size. Yeah. Yes. So um, the Valley Out of Time books and the Crypto Codex were all digest size because right. I, I think that's a little bit more wieldy at the table generally. Um, Science Wizard will be eight and a half by 11. It, it cool. will be a full-size book. I want to do the, the hardback. Uh, that hardback art came from the artist as a freebie. He, he gave me that art and said, hey, maybe you could use this for a flyer or something. And a couple of people looked at it and they said, that is the cover of your book or get out of gaming. Yeah. Because it's very weird and cool and sciencey and absolutely nails you know what you would think of as a science wizard so and i could see uh, that like in a nice neon green or a, a you know well funny you should say that because green is the next color there we go because a red red and yellow uh was what uh what the original hardback was in right yeah yeah red yeah. orange yellowish yeah, yeah. It, it, it's a great color combination and so i could definitely see using the same color a uh, cover and and it, you know if you have two or three of them you know just picking a different color palette um why not yeah it's a great cover so you're you're absolutely right yeah yeah i want to i want to keep doing that because i i do love that color and yeah. that artist uh wonky keelan halverson is coming back for crypt 2 so uh he's gonna do a number of things um my my guy uh ed bickford robot ed yep. yeah he's gonna do the cover and if, if it comes out the way it is in my brain, it's going to be mind blowing. Nice. So very happy. Awesome. Uh, you know, we've, we've run through the show notes. Uh, Nick, did you have any other questions you wanted to ask Skeeter? Um, I think I got them, got them in. Uh, usually yeah. uh, we'll hit you with the, 
the, do you have any any closing thoughts? And that's what I that was what I was about to go to. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, any sage advice or closing thoughts on uh, on for, you know for people? You know, our general listeners or folks who are thinking about getting into doing um, you know third party products for Goodman Games. So, don't be afraid to try. The, yeah. The literally the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to screw up, and I will. I will tell you, I screw something up every single time. Um, you won't get the experience and wisdom to solve problems until you screw something up. If you continually don't have any problems, you're not going to expand. Yeah. Um, so as long as you don't take people's money and then ghost, they are generally pretty forgiving. So if you run into a snag and, you know, your product doesn't deliver when you said it is, as long as you talk to people, they are generally pretty cool about it. So, yeah, my biggest thing is just don't, don't be afraid. I, I have not done a lot of things out of fear and I regretted the heck out of it. So do it. I mean, this is a game we if you are writing something for this game it is because you love it and you want to give back that's that's why i ever got into it so yeah and i think that's that's all the excuse you need to be a third party publisher there's yeah. no there's no tests there's no there's no classes we have to take there's nothing it's just you know a, a love of the game uh, so thorough that you're willing to put something out there for, for other sure. people and especially, and especially in the DCC and MCC community, uh, Goodman Games has been nothing but overwhelmingly supportive. Um, the the community, God, if you go to a convention and you find the Goodman Games booth, there is always just a mass of people sharing stories, talking with the people in the booth, ideas, games. Um, if you go to any of the judges, they're always so enthusiastic and just it is such a raw, genuine love for playing the game that it it's great to be a part of. Yeah, I totally agree. Thank you, Skeeter. Um, Thank you, guys. That was great. So, you know, I've learned several things and, you know, um, I've run a couple. I have learned before. nothing and I will stay <laughs> with that. <laughs> No, I, I, I have, and um, I have watched you guys and what you've done on Kickstarter and gone, hmm, uh, I think I'm going to borrow that <laughs> idea. Absolutely, right? You know, and, yeah. and, and that's, that's actually a great thing for anybody. Um, if you have a creator that you've had a good relationship with on Kickstarter, watch what they do. And watch what they don't do. Yeah, yep. yeah, and 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 I th and I think I think to to mirror what Skeeter says, don't be afraid uh, afraid to try something, try something new, a new approach to a traditional product, right? Um, you know, uh, I I got a number of comments back from some of the uh, smoking worm monographs that I that I released this past year, with um, you know with all the pockets and and sleeves and all that stuff and. And, you know, I found, I found that, you know, when I think back on it, that it was really hard for me to describe what I was going to do without the finished product to show you, this is what yeah. I'm going to do. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's difficult. Yeah. yeah. I know I have a bushel of your luck tokens <laughs> sitting right over there, man. I love those things. That's awesome. Man. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, this last Kickstarter, we, 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 we flushed out luck tokens are done. I'm not going to do them again for the foreseeable future. Um, and I ordered, uh, what did I order? 2,200 luck tokens. Oh, it was wonderful. Yeah. It, yeah. Was, it, it took me, it actually took me a week, uh, which is not hard work, right? But putting them in sleeves and making sure everything. Oh yeah. Around, um, you know, so I do that. I do all that work in front of a television watching movies. So it's like, oh yeah. This week I get to sit down and watch Ghostbusters, all of them, and I'm going to watch yeah. all of this. You know, we're going to when I when I Lord of the Rings when I so. pack books, 
I uh, I put on the Shutter channel and watch horror movies as I'm packing books. Yeah, so it's yeah. Just, yeah, no time wasted. Nope. So um, so yeah, so and and those are always generating ideas. But you know, yeah. Well, I'm I'm thank you for buying them. Um, I oh think oh, absolutely. Fun. Jeez, I uh, I in one of Goodman's online auctions, I got Harley Stroh's luck tokens that he had. So ah, yeah, I, I am, or whatever. Yeah, I am slowly building a, a treasure hoard of all of Harley's Horcruxes. So one <laughs> one day I will possess Harley Stroh. I tried to buy his hat on one of them, and he wouldn't go for it. So, <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, Ed threw in, uh, uh, and feel free to reach out to them for advice. So. Um, I, I wanted to, to add that in there because I think that's a, a really important thing is that, you know, general, generally speaking, we all um, welcome new, uh, new third party publishers and want to help you and usher you into this new world of third party publishing. Absolutely. So. Um, you know, you can always reach out to us. Uh, my website is uh, smokingworm.com. And uh, uh, Nick, yours is Breaker Press Games, right? Dot com. Yep. And Skeeter, yours is Skeeter Green Productions. Is that correct? Dot com. Yep. Dot com. So and I realize call- that's a lot of letters to type in. Yeah. Uh, but if you just put in Skeeter Green uh, and Google it, it pops right up because I wasn't sure if you had a website. Oh, don't do website. that. <laughs> 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 uh, oh, boy. Don't go to images. Don't go to images. Uh, no, I, I did. I did want to say also uh, that my buddy Zach Glazer from Frog God Games and I do uh, Skeeter and Zach's small publishing seminars at conventions and online. Uh, You can go to those. We try to help everybody um, learn what the difference between being a small publisher and a freelancer is. And we try to answer small publisher questions. And we've had a couple of people that have gone to the seminars actually put product out. And it is so exciting to see. It's like, oh, that's so great. You know, we had some small part in encouraging somebody to put out a product. That's just the best thing ever. It's a good feeling, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Um, I, I have gotten so much from role playing in the 40 three or four years that I've been playing that I need to make sure other people have a shot at it. Like I did. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. All right. I, uh, Nick, unless you got anything else, Skeeter, I think think that's a positive note to end on. I think that's a great note to end on. I have spoken too much, so I will stop now. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Next week, we actually will be right back to the Scrivener on, uh, on Friday. Um, and we're going to be talking about, uh, we're going to be talking to um, Kay Kovac, uh, or Kovac, I'm not sure how she pronounces her last name. Um, she is the art director for Chaosium. And uh, we're going to be talking about what art direction is, how it can be done, and how you can do it as a one-man production. Um, and then uh, I think I think what, uh, what, uh, what, what Jay told us is, they're going to run. They're going to run us through, um, uh, you know, art direction from concept to finished product, and what are all the steps that they go through and everything. So this is someone who does a lot of art direction, and uh, and so I think it'll be a really great conversation, and um, I'm looking forward to it. So I'm gonna watch uh, that for sure. Yeah, yeah. So check it out. That'll be next week. Uh, we had to compress this one back a week because of some family events the previous week. Um, and then uh, we've got a couple episodes after that for the rest of the year. But uh, everybody, have a great night and thank you for listening. Yep. Thank you, everybody. Mm-hmm.